good meaning making, wisdom, the overcoming of self-deception, the affording of this connection, they're not optional for you. You either do it consciously and reflectively with the best help of great minds and great friends, or you do it individualistically or manipulated by, you know, cultural forces that do not have your best interest at heart. All right, so John Verveke is here again, and I'm really excited that he's taking the time to talk again. Um, there were some questions that I never got to, and I think I will just give another short uh, introduction in case anybody didn't catch the catch it the first time well i i mean the air i'm appointed in cognitive psychology and cognitive science um as a scientist i study intelligence consciousness rationality mindfulness wisdom and my big overall project is to understand the history and the science behind the meaning crisis and to help uh people awaken from it respond to it create individual and communal uh, colleges of practices and homes to help people ameliorate the meaning crisis because I think as long as people are starved for meaning they do not have the cognitive flexibility to address the problems facing us nor are they willing to sacrifice a hit to their standard of living to address all of the problems that face us and I think we are going to need to take a hit to our standard of living in order to address the problems facing us the millennials know this already um, and the rest of us just have to catch on to it. Uh, and so um, trying to make that go as well as possible, because it could go very badly, is, I guess, my primary mission. Cool. Um, I, that brings up a question I had. When you do your studies, like, for example, you said you study wisdom. How, what are the parameters that you're looking at? Like, what, what defines wisdom, I guess? <laughs> so the reason why that's funny is um, just before COVID hit, uh, a bunch of uh, the researchers, we got together in person and virtually <clears throat> most of the major researchers in the field within psychology, neuroscience, and cognitive science. And all we did was argue and discuss for 10 hours. And then, and this was led by Igor e. Grossman, and then write and rewrite and challenge each other. And we produced a consensus paper that's been published and it's doing quite well. Um, I think where can that be found? Oh, that can be found. I can I can give you a link. I'll send you a link. Perfect. Uh, excellent. Um, so um, some of the main features are uh, a meta perspectival ability, ability to take other perspectives. Um, related to that is the capacity to see through ways in which we're misframing things, misapprehending things, misrepresenting things, thereby reducing self-deception. Um, there's also uh, an ability to um, morally ground that ability. So it's not just done manipulatively, but it's done in some sense in order to help human beings flourish, connect us better to each other, to ourselves, to the world. Um, that was the consensus. I would say there's um, it's uh, some additional features I would add in, but that's the, that's the consensus view as to, I agree with the, I, I was one of the co-authors, so I agree with the consensus, but like all consensus that not everybody, everybody's, nobody is completely happy with it, but everybody's generally happy with it. Um, and so I, the hope, and this seems to be the case is that this will provide a guide, uh, to people who want to study it, um, scientifically. Now, in another area, I've been working with Nathan Vanderpool. And we've been talking to all of the leaders of these emerging communities of ecology and practices and asking them what is wisdom, what are virtues. And we're crafting together a bottom up from the various practitioners account. And then at some point, we're going to try and put the two accounts together as best as we can. That's interesting. Like It's interesting because I've been using the word wisdom a lot as I've been talking to people. Nobody ever question me, questions me and says, well, what do you mean by that? Like, we all seem to know what it means, but then to actually 
define it is it is hard to like when you said that you study it I was like how would you do a study to find out who is wise <laughs> like that's that's interesting well we've been studying it empirically for a long time but part of what uh, and we've developed various scales but the part of the reason why for the consensus paper is to try and uh, do a lot more theoretical philosophical reflection on getting very clear uh, about what we mean by this. I mean, uh, since basically Socrates on, we've been asking that question in a very deep and ongoing manner. The, the question, uh, we get into that kind of open-ended questioning when we think about any of the virtues. What really is honesty? And, and of course, you're right. If we didn't have any sense of what it is, we couldn't, like if you had no sense of what honesty is, I couldn't interest you in it or teach you in it. Same thing, if you had no sense of what wisdom is, if you had no sense of sometimes seeing through illusion into reality and knowing what the right thing to do is and overcoming a self-deceptive pattern, then of course I couldn't interest you in it at all. But on the other hand, I doubt that you would give me or you'd be satisfied with any proposed definition of honesty you gave. Same thing with wisdom. So the point isn't to give a final definition. The point is to really afford a well-constructed concept so that scientific investigation can proceed uh, more smoothly. Yeah. Um, can you give me an example of like what is on some of when you're researching it? Like what is, I don't know, are you doing questionnaires or? Uh, some like are, a lot, some are questionnaires. Um, some of them you give people sort of problems to solve. Um, I don't do a lot of the direct testing part of it. Uh, my part has been to try and help people draw on ideas from artificial intelligence psychology, machine learning, things like that, and, and philosophy in order to sharpen the theoretical end of it. Where I do empirical work, I do empirical work around what you might call some of the components, like what goes into an insight experience, what happens when people are experiencing self-transcendence. So um, there are people who try to create direct measures of wisdom, and those are helpful, but they're still, they're still kind of rusty. They're still kind of clunky. Mm -hmm. um, I I prefer to try and study some of the more specific components that would go into making somebody wise. Okay. Um, I was re-listening to our interview and you were mentioning that you've read um, The Lord of Light, Fifth Business, and Siddhartha. Yes. And, and, and then you mentioned that if I, if I understood correctly, you were saying that after going through some therapy and stuff, you realized that Christianity was traumatizing or going through, like, or reading those books was traumatizing. I didn't understand what you meant. Uh, no, the books were, the books sort of broke me out of the fundamentalist Christian framework I had been brought up within. Um, and it was only later when I was doing therapy to try and deal with sort of the hole that that left in me, that I realized how traumatic um, that whole experience had been for me. And, you know, dealing with certain episodes and things like that. So was it, do you think it's like, a lot of our listeners are going to be able to understand this. Like, is it, is it the actual like practicing of the religion that ends up being traumatizing? Or is it the collapse of the belief that's traumatizing? Like, it's interesting how you can be practicing for years and years and years and there's no problem there but now that the the belief has collapsed that's where you're you're i don't know that's where the i guess that's where i've felt the trauma i don't know maybe maybe i had a different experience than others and i wasn't feeling the trauma while i was there i don't know if that makes sense though if, it does yeah. i mean i don't i don't think i was I don't think I was fully aware of what was going on to me. I was a kid, right? Um, but um, I, I don't think it was just belief. It was a, it was a matter of belief, and what I, and also just moments of realization, and also moments of terror and panic. Um, there was definitely mm -hmm. an affective component. <clears throat> there was a component of seeing, and it dawned on me very gradually. Um, but seeing the undercurrent of deep anxiety underneath the uh, proposed layer of happiness and joy <clears throat> and seeing the anxiety and the acrimony. And it was like, mm. and um, 
And, but and then there were also moments of sort of almost reflective consideration. I was listening. Um, I became a big fan of the Beatles, and I was listening to a song by John Lennon, and it just occurred to me, <clears throat> I couldn't accept the fact that he was somehow in hell. I'm not claiming John Lennon was a perfect person, but the music he was producing and the effect it was having on me, I was like, uh, uh, that just doesn't work for me. I just can't put that together. I can't put together this kind of artistry, the beauty, uh, the, the thoughtfulness um, with, the, with some sort of absolute condemnation of this individual. No one, no, no one of these events was like it, but it was the set of them and they grew on me. And, and I had always been very, very interested in science um, and especially evolution because I really loved dinosaurs as a kid. Um, and so that all of those things were sort of undermining from in many different dimensions simultaneously. And then when I read these books and they opened up the possibility of a different mythology, a different religious orientation, a different fundamental philosophy, um, I, I couldn't I couldn't go back. Right. Um, you know, you're you're in this space where there still are a lot of um, I don't know. Not I, there are people that hear what you're saying and they recognize that there's some degree of truth to it, but they may still be practicing in their religious faith. I think for the most part, they wouldn't consider themselves in a fundamental religion, and so they're just thinking, "Oh, there's no problem here." Um, but how do you balance saying what you think and not offending those that think differently than you? Because it seems like you do have, you're you're trying to have an audience as big as possible but how do you stay um i don't know true to what you really think at, too at the same time well i mean it's not just what i think it's what i aspire to do and the virtues that i want to cultivate so the figure that i most pattern my life on that i aspire most to be like is socrates uh, and uh, and socrates placed a tremendous emphasis on wisdom um but he tied that wisdom to a very deep sense on one hand of wonder and of humility on the other hand. And so I also believe in the practice that he engaged in, which is a deep kind of dialogue with other people. And he made it very clear that his self-examination and his self-knowledge was bound to what uh, these, these dialogues or what I call the logos and what, what emerged uh, within them. And he was willing to follow that logos. Um, so what that means is when, when I, meet people who want to not only communicate with me, but commune with me to, to, to converse in really deep and good faith, um, then I'm open to that. And I am open to listening from them. Um, so for me, if both people, say it was you and I, get to a place that we couldn't have got to on our own, then that is, I followed the Socratic tradition. And so um, I am not out to destroy another position. Um, I'm honest with what I believe, but I'm also honest, at least I hope I am, that I want to learn from other people. I want to be challenged by other people. And that has been reliably the case. Um, I also am very clear on this. Uh, I don't, I, I, I know in the sense that I have very good evidence and reason to believe that people can stay within a, an existing religion and cultivate wisdom and self-transcendence, virtue, deep connections to others uh, without having to swallow uh, a, a lot of, um, I, I don't know what to call them, illegitimate, uh, irrational beliefs or something like that. Um, and so I, I, I don't foreclose on anybody. I don't say, well, there's no way you're going to find wisdom within your religion, because I don't believe that's true. I think there are people that for which that's true. And since I put a big store on non-propositional knowing, and right, the four kinds of knowing, um, for me, that if, if people are genuinely cultivating wisdom and virtue and meaning, I don't want to disturb that. And I don't want to claim some kind of knowledge that I don't have. What I do say is this, for a growing number of people, the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S's, those who have no official religious tradition, they are still hungry for wisdom and meaning and depth. That's why they frequently describe themselves as spiritual, not religious. 
But what they mean by not religious is they do not find the existing religions viable. They do not find them uh, reconcilable with a scientific and technological worldview. They do not find them places that are genuinely helping them deal with foolishness, helping to cultivate wisdom and virtue, enhancing their sense of meaningfulness. Um, and so I want to address that real and growing demographic of people um, who are experiencing the meaning crisis. If somebody is trying, engaged in a not good faith project of trying to convince me that their particular religious view is the only way in which wisdom and meaning can be found, I will challenge that. I will challenge it respectfully as long as they're respectful. If they become disrespectful and very proselytizing, then I will become much more like a, a, a sort of verbal martial artist in the interaction because then the point of the interaction, which is the possibility of both people learning, has been destroyed. Um, so I'm giving you a complex answer because you asked me about how to balance, and I try to balance between all of those constraints in that way. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you touched on the four kinds of way of knowing. Can you define that? Because some of people may not be familiar. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so the the form of knowing that most people are very familiar with is propositional knowing. A proposition is a statement that you can evaluate for being true or false. So this is knowing that, and then I put some proposition in it, knowing that cats are mammals, right? <clears throat> and so I can judge whether or not that's true or false. Is it true that cats are mammals? And it turns out to be true, right? And you have a specific kind of memory for it. <clears throat> Sorry, it's called semantic memory. It's your memory of for facts. Like, for example, you know that cats are mammals. You know that two plus two equals four. But that's it. You know it as a fact. You know it as a proposition. That's different from what's called procedural knowing. This is knowing how to do something. This is knowing how to catch a ball, how to kiss someone, how to climb a tree, how to swim, right? This doesn't result in beliefs. It results in skills. And skills aren't true or false. They're appropriate or not to a situation. And you have a very different kind of memory for that. It's called procedural memory. And by the way, you can have one of these damaged without the other being damaged, and, mm -hmm. right? And vice versa. Now there's a, a next kind of knowing, which is your perspectival knowing. If procedural knowing is about your skill, you have to know, but what is it, a skill? A skill is way, a way of shaping your sensory motor interaction with the world. But in order to shape sensory motor interaction, you have to have sensory motor interaction. You have to have what's going on right now. You're moving by sensing, you're sensing by moving, and you may say, but I'm still, but you're still moving your attention, your eyes are still saccading, like you're always moving, and you're always sensing as you're moving, and you're always moving as you're sensing, and so there's a sensory motor loop, and what that's giving you is that's giving you a sense of here nowness, and uh, like, as we say, a perspective, what's foregrounded, what's backgrounded, how, how are the parts fitting together into whole, what's it, what state of mind are you in? right? So that you have a, a presence in this particular situation. That, that's your perspectival knowing. It's knowing what it's like to be you in your state of mind in this situation. Th that doesn't result in skills. It doesn't result in beliefs. It results in perspectives. And perspectives aren't true or false. They're not powerful or not. They're present or not. So like when you're in a video game, you want to be present in the game. You want to have that, you know, that coupled sensory motor loop with the situation, things foregrounded and backgrounded, a salience landscape that is making things so that you feel in the game, so it feels real to you. You have these different senses of real. And you have another kind of memory for that. It's called your episodic memory. This is where you remember scenes from your past and you relive them because you go into the perspectival knowing. Now, that ability to right, have a perspective to, on the world is based on a deeper kind of knowing, which is participatory knowing. This has to do with the way in which reality is unfolding, the way evolution is unfolding, the way culture is unfolding, the way your cognition is unfolding, such that the world and you are co-shaped. So here, there's a bottle, right? This, the, right, the, the matter, this bottle and I are both with, we're both co-participating in gravity. So we're both being shaped by gravity. So that's one way the bottle and I belong together. We're, we're shaped by gravity. 
but there's also been biological evolution. I have, right, I'm bipedal, so I have these hands that can grasp things and objects of certain size. There's been culture that has made this object and taught me how to use it. So all of those things are shaping me and the world. The world and I are co-participating in this co-shaping process so that the bottle is graspable by me. Now, is, it, is, it, is, is being graspable a property of the bottle? No, it's not graspable by a mitochondria, right? It's not graspable by a stone, right? Is, it, it's, is graspability in my hand? No, I can't grasp Africa, right? It's between us. It's between my hand and the bottle because of the co-shaping of physics and evolution and culture and also my cognition. Right now I'm thirsty, so I'm now oriented towards it and it's standing out for me as something that might contain water. And even at that level, we're being co we're participating in the way that real relationship is opening up. The affordance, all the affordances that open up between us. So the participatory knowing is stored in you in a very interesting kind of memory, that memory of how you as an agent fit to the world as an arena for action. And you call that really unique form of participatory memory yourself. Hmm. You have a sense of self. Your sense of self and the affordances, right? There's a whole field of affordances opened up around me by my sense of self and my participatory knowing. Then my perspectival knowing, my state of consciousness, right? What's will pick out which one of those affordances are salient. And then that will trigger which skills I bring to bear to interact. And as I interact, that leads to which beliefs I form. Those <laughs> are the four kinds of knowing. And the important point for our discussion is most of the meaning making machinery, that sense of that vital sense of connectedness to yourself, to each other and the world, is carried by the non-propositional forms of knowing, not by the belief kind uh, level of knowing. So you're, where does belief fall in then? Like if you're saying like, well, I believe, um, I, be, I believe my husband is faithful or something like that. that it's a belief that I can't be 100% sure about, but it's like, where, where's that? Is that a knowledge? Or is or, or belief separate than these kinds of knowing? So first of all, does that do make you, sense? It does. It makes sense. So, because when I'm having conversations with people, and a lot of times they'll say they know something, and then when you press them on that, they admit, "Well, we can't know anything, right?" And you get into these conversations, but but they're talking about it at the level of propositional knowing, right? So yes. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to decide like whether I could have some kind of conversation like that and then bring up a definition thing like this and just be like, okay, let's make sure we're talking about this, the same thing, right? Well, first of all, let's be careful how you're using the word belief. Do you have beliefs about your husband or did you believe in your husband? Um, probably I believe in him in that, in that okay. example. So right? you're using the older sense of the word. The older sense of the word isn't the assertion of a proposition. It's belaben, which means to give your heart to someone. Now, what is it to give your heart to somebody? Is it to have beliefs about them? Could you have could you have all kinds of beliefs about somebody and not believe in them? Do you think that's possible? Sure. Of course. Right. So what's missing? What do you think's missing? Um, I don't know that you can count on them, right? The future, like I don't know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. So notice that notice and that you're being very honest. I'm not trying to box you in or anything, right? You're saying. Well, I got a sense, but I don't know, which it means I, I, like, I can't capture it by a set of statements. Well, isn't it a, a lot of these things combined together? I mean, aren't you, isn't your sense of identity? I'm sorry, I don't want to presume. Are, are you straight? Yeah. You said husband. I just want, okay. So is your sense of identity and how it's changing bound up to him, his sense and how his, his identity changes? Like, don't, aren't you in some way, we have this metaphor, aren't you growing together as opposed to growing apart? Hopefully, right? Yeah. Right. But I'm trying to say that's participatory knowing. You're not talking about beliefs. You're talking about the fact 
that you and he are bound together and you're shaping each other in a way in which your sense of self, his sense of self and your sense of self are get, getting bound and coupled together in a deep way. That Right? Does that make is Yes. That, right? Are you not capable of taking his perspective in a way that has a huge empathic impact on you? Like you can, when you take his perspective, it's not just like, you know, I wonder what William Shakespeare thought about this. You take his perspective and it calls to you, right? It reaches out to you in a powerful way, mm -hmm. right? You've made a special way of internalizing his perspective and presumably he's doing the same for you. Yes. You've also learned a bunch of skills, and this is the compatibility, right? You, you, you know how to be around him, right? Don't you? Mm -hmm. In a way that you wouldn't presume with a stranger. This is true. <laughs> and is, is it not all of these things that bind you to him and give you a sense of trust in him that supersedes just all the true beliefs you may have about him? Sure. And actually, that does describe when I used to say, I believe the church is true. It was a participatory knowing because it's like yes. I'm interacting with this organization in a way that I think it's making my life better and I'm making the yes. world better. And yes. therefore, it's true. And it's not like I know it's true. Um, no, it isn't that propositional knowing. So no, it's, I, it's, yeah. It we, we have this other sense of truth. But I think about... what happens is you do think it's there. And then when you find out some set of information that's like, no, it can't be that anymore. That's when you kind of get crushed a little bit. You have to grow up a little yeah. bit at least. You, you can, but I, I, I just, let me return to that okay. point. I wanted to say something, but notice we do have, a, we have other senses of true other than the truth of a proposition. And, and we talk about being true to someone. Yes. Which isn't stating a lot of true things about them. It's right, about right. this kind of connection. And there's, there's a connection between truth and troth, like being betrothed to somebody, right? Or his aim was true. Notice we're talking about a skill there. We're not talking about a proposition. So we have a sense of true that's non-propositional that has to do with all the stuff we're talking about here. Yes. And, and, and part of what can happen is we can, we can discover a deep discontinuity between credo, the things I believe, the things we're stating, and this kind of troth and trust sense of truth, or as I like to put it, other senses of realness, mm -hmm. the sense of realness that comes from procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing. And when we get that, we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. We can revise our understanding of the propositions. We can say, oh, those propositions aren't really meant to be true statements about the world. They're made to be sort of coaching statements that help me to cultivate, right? And that you see this in some religions, uh, uh, Buddhism, skillful means. The propositions are, I mean, not, not, not every Buddhist would agree with what I'm saying, but there's groups of Buddhists will say, the propositions aren't meant to be taken as truths. They're meant to be taken as, en as ennobling uh, coaching practices that help you cultivate the wisdom and the, tra the self-transcendence and the connectedness. Mm -hmm. Or you may meet people that say, no, 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 you have to live and die with the propositions. And then you have to decide if you're going to stay or leave. Um, so you can see people taking, right, whether they take the first or the second strategy depends on the, 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 re the religious home they find themselves within. If they have a religious home that is very open to like reinterpretation and right, re re un understanding a lot of it as, this word isn't quite right, but symbolic or, or having to do like the kind of language a coach uses with you. And I use or, the word metaphorical. Yeah, metaphorical, that, but it, it's not, you see, it's, it's not. You didn't like even symbolic. So that's interesting. Yeah, because it's not enough. Uh, um, but I know what you're talking about. So that, that's right. interesting that you can't find the words. Well, I, I talked. Because it's more than that. And that's what bothers people when you say, well, I metaphorically believe. And they, they're like, well, that's not enough. And that's exactly that. They're yes. like, no, that's not enough. And you're trying to explain to them, like, no, it's a lot more than you think it is. <laughs> but there isn't right. a good word for it. Well, I mean, there are. I mean, I, I think the old, I think if we went back to older notions of faith, love, and hope, we'd have better words for it. Mm. Uh, but um, unfortunately, those words have also been turned into proposition assertions. Right. When I talk to Nick Winkleman, he's a coach and he's trying to help people run. And he'll say, look, when you start running, Run like you're an airplane taking off, 
And then when you get to a certain place, run like you're running up a hill rather than on a, on a flat, flat plane. And people don't just, this isn't just a symbol, they enact it. And by, this is the imaginal. And by enacting it, they start to see both in the world and in the body ways they couldn't see. And they're able to gain the skills and the perspectives and even the identity needed to undertake the task. And that's not just a symbol. That's not just a metaphor. That's something you're actually enacting that enables you to see and be in ways you couldn't see and be so that you can actually undergo the real transformation that allows you to address the problems that are at hand. Yeah. I'm going to get into not necessarily criticism, but I'm going to, I'm going to press you a little bit because I think there's a lot of, well, let's start with how would you describe what the meaning crisis is? Like what, what is the meaning crisis? Um, why should anyone care? Like, what is this? Uh, well, why, first of all, why, first of all, let's be clear about what we mean by meaning and why you should care. Um, I don't mean meaning in the sense of what's in a proposition. I mean this connectedness to yourself, to each other in the world. Um, and you, that, you, that's the core of your intelligence, right? Uh, if you, there is so much you could pay paying attention to, there's so much in your memory, you could, and all the various combinations, there is so many different things, different sequences of operations you could do. There's so many things you could think about. And yet, out of all of that astronomical vastness, you zero in on what's relevant right now. And you ignore most of it. So what makes you intelligent, and this is the, pro, this is the thing we're having difficulty giving to artificial general intelligence is exactly that ability to ignore most of the information and zero in on the relevant information. Now, relevance isn't a, it isn't a thing. It isn't a property of things. Like, is this bottle relevant or not? Well, it, in and of itself, no. Is the relevance in me? No, right? It's an affordance. Relevance is the affordance for cognition. When this is relevant to me, that means that an, a real relation between me and has opened up such that I can zero in on the needed information in order to solve a problem. And this is not cold calculation. You care about this information and you don't care about that information. So saying you don't care about that connectedness, that relevance realization makes no, mis makes no sense. Hmm. You're, 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 dece you're, at, you're sort of meta deceiving yourself and you're deceiving yourself about your self deception because you care about this information rather than that information every second. And you care about whether or not it really fits you to your world. Because if it doesn't, you've made a mistake and you've judged, judged the wrong things as relevant. And you know when you overcome that and it gives you a little moment of joy, you call it an aha moment. You go, aha, and you're filled with brightness and light and joy because you thought you were connected, you realized you weren't, and then you found the real connection. So saying you don't care about connectedness and meaning, uh, I, 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 I've you given don't. you a reason why I, I don't believe that can be deeply true. Um, it may be you're not reflectively caring about it. Now, here's the thing you can ask yourself. Well, do you want that to happen haphazardly? If this is so central and you have so much human motivation attached to it, this is why we love insight and why we love the flow state, because they are these moments where we're deeply connected. So it's a powerful evolutionary marker for you. Right? There's no culture in which people don't experience insight or flow and find it intrinsically valuable. Now, do you want that meaning-making capacity and the ability to overcome self-deception? Do you want that to happen haphazardly, unconsciously, or do you want to do it as best as you possibly can? This is the Socratic answer. You should want to do it as the best you possibly can. What's the meaning crisis? The meaning crisis, and there's all kinds of symptoms. We can talk about the symptoms of it in a few minutes. But the meaning crisis is... That is, is one of my questions. So, yes, yes. continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. The, the, the meaning crisis is that meaning and, and, and good meaning-making, wisdom, the overcoming of self-deception, the affording of this connection, they're not optional for you. You either do it consciously and reflectively with the best help of great minds and great friends, or you do it individualistically or manipulated by 
you know, cultural forces that do not have your best interest at heart, and it's constructed ap haphazardly. You are letting, look at the phones and the social media, you are letting lots of people shape your salience landscaping all the time. Now, here's the thing. When you actually maybe realize that, and you realize how much, sorry, I don't mean to be offensive, but bullshit, how much there is where people are manipulating salience so you can't see what's real. When you, when you realize that and you want to do something about it, where do you go? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> That's the question. And think about it. He'll make the question more intense. We, we have now, we now, it's never been the case as much as now that we needed to wade through so much information. There's way more information. There's way more polluted and manip We have never needed discernment and the ability to zero in on what's genuinely relevant as much as we have now. We have never needed wisdom more and we have never been starved for it as much as we are now. That's the heart of the meaning crisis. That could have been a conference talk from the uh, brethren of the church, other than they would have said to trust them. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I think some, some either ex-Christians or ex-Latter-day Saints, they will say something like, we don't need to worry ourselves about meaning. Um, and you've, you've laid out a pretty good argument, um, but... They might say something like, we're just creating the problem. They might even say something like, it's our religious background that's probably leaving this hole in our heart. It wouldn't even be there in the first place had we not like grown up in this religion that said that there has to be a meaning or else. Um, and how much of the pain that you feel from like existential angst is caused by, could be caused by that. Like, is that, that's, that's something I hear like, um, when I was stepping away from it, I had a lot of like issues with nihilism, like, yes. okay, so if we're just balls of meat, does it matter? Like what matters, you know, like, so a lot of other people don't seem to get that existential angst from that idea. They just say, well, it is what it is. And they, I think they are actually still focusing on their families, their children. They, they found something else and they'll say that they, there's no problem there. Um, right. but I, it, yeah. So anyways, say, so, so, say like you were talking, to, I'm, I'm not that person, but there's definitely, they're not satisfied with, um, the, the proposition that there is even a meaning crisis. So they're just going to go on as, does that make sense? There, it does. Like, so why should they care? Or if you laid out it really well, like you're going to care <laughs> about it, but, um, anyway, maybe address that. A little bit more specifically i will so first of all let's take a take a look at people who like there's a large number of people in the nuns that were not brought up in any religious tradition mm -hmm. but they don't typically fall into nihilism they typically take up this very ambiguous phrase i'm spiritual but not religious and what they then then do is they they te they tend to create a religion of me or a religion of us their little group and so, like you said, people, uh, and I don't believe in all that meeting stuff. Uh, and, you know, well, well, what do you care about? Well, I care about my family. And why? They're just sacks of meat, too. Like, what do you, and, and all you're doing is moving air molecules around when you say you love them. It, it, like, what, what do you mean by any of it? Well, um, um, what, like, it's important to me. Yes, import. It's relevant to you. And you want to be relevant to them, right? So you are, you, 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 you can't avoid relevance realization. You can pretend that you're not engaging in it, but that's what it is. It's a kind of pretense. And so what you find is a lot of these people, are, as I said, are spiritual but not religious. And so they are trying to find ways of overcoming self-deception, ways of enhancing a sense of connectedness, right? A, a, a way of feeling that they are connected to something beyond their own egocentric concerns ways of transforming themselves into more virtuous selves. They'll say, oh, I don't believe in any of that stuff, but I believe people should be really honest. It's like, why? Why? Like, what? Uh, you should just face the truth. Oh, so you think truth is something that's relevant and important and that people should care about. Yes. 
oh, well, no, I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean, right? You get into those kinds of issues and problems. And then what people will often say is, okay, yes, yes, I admit it. I, there's things that are important to me, but, you know, that's not religious. And, and they'll say, well, you know, what do you mean by that? Religio means to be bound to something. It means to devote time and attention to it. It means that you look to it for guidance. You don't really understand completely how it works, perhaps, uh, but you entrust your identity and trust to them. And people say, well, I don't have that. And then I point to their phone. And I say, live without your phone for three days and tell me about the anxiety you feel when you don't have your phone. And then don't tell me you're not religious. So you, you can do things like that. Or <laughs> you can say, well, there's a lot of things happening in the world that are best explained by the fact that people are struggling to find meaning. You have high suicide rates that are independent of clinical depression, even in areas of high affluence, and that the age at which people are committing suicide is dropping. We now have children committing suicide. We have, of course, related mental health crises of increasing anxiety and depression. We have a loneliness epidemic. We have the fact that people are more and more addicted either to substances or to practices or to conspiracy theories, et cetera. We have the people prefer virtual reality over real reality, the virtual exodus. They prefer to live within social media or virtual uh, video games because they have all the things that are missing from so-called reality. But you also have positive responses. You have people taking up mindfulness, the, the emergence of stoicism, you have all these emerging communities of practices where people are really trying to cultivate ways of overcoming self-deception, ways of enhancing connectedness, paying attention to the non-propositional aspects of meaning. What's a good explanation for all of that? That meaning matters, and when people are starving for it, it affects them in a negative way and motivates them to try and change and transform. Those are the two kinds of arguments I would bring to bear. Um. Now, when you, do you think that religions do fill that gap then? So is it the, those stepping away from religion that's causing a lot of those negative things? No, no, or... I, I, I think it's the fact that, see, when Nietzsche went into the marketplace and said God was dead, the madman, Nietzsche wrote about this parable God is tot, and the madman runs into the marketplace, and this is where it was first pronounced, God is dead. He's not talking to the believers. He's talking to the atheists. And, there's, and they sort of titter at him, and ha, 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 silly man. And he says, no, no, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm talking about. You've taken a sponge, and you've wiped away the sky. You've unchained us, and we're now forever falling. How are we going to become worthy of this? How are we going to become worthy of this event? Now, what Nietzsche is, and Nietzsche is no sympathy, he has no sympathy for Christianity, but what he's saying is, right, again, it's not primarily the propositions that matter. It's all the ways in which religion was functional for people. We in the West have created this distinction between religion and culture and wisdom and meaning making. Most other cultures don't have a distinct word for that. They don't separate these things out. They're all enmeshed together. And so I don't think it's just people who have left religion that are feeling the whole. I think what's happening is we had an entire ball of wax culture, mythology, ritual, what we would call religion, philosophy, and we inherited it from the Axial Revolution. But the Scientific Revolution, the Protestant Reformation, these are all stuff I go over in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. All of these historical events have undermined the worldview that gave us a way of talking about the practices we engage in when we're trying to cultivate wisdom, engage in self self. Uh, transcendence, overcome self-deception. Those two are bound together, by the way, and enhance our sense of connectedness to what's real. And by the way, people really care about being connected to what's real. 
people, okay, you take, take my students, they come in and they're all filled with the, you know, the cynicism and the nihilism and all, all right. And, and, and I'm not trying to make light of that. They suffer because of it. And then I'll say, how many of you are in really satisfying romantic relationships? Because another thing that our culture tries to replace religion with is romantic relationships. And we build all this around, and romantic relationships are supposed to bear the burden of God. And I'll say, how many of you are in really satisfying romantic relationships? And, put their hands. and I said, now, of those people who put up your hands after they put down their hands, how many of you would want to know that your partner was cheating on you, even if that meant the destruction of the relationship? 95% of the people put up their hands. And I say, well, why? Why do you want to know this if it's going to destroy the relationship? And, they, and, 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 here, and, the, and then they say innocently, very innocently, oh, because it's not real. They want to be connected what's real so what i'm saying is i don't think the need for religio that's one of the potential etymologic sources of the word religion right is something like unique to people that have been exposed to religion i think that need, religio means to bind to be connected i as i'm trying to argue i think there is no culture in which this the attempt to access activate educate and celebrate the meaning making machinery is not pursued i'm not religious do you listen to music of course i do well why well it's so oh meaningful yeah well, yeah exactly it, co it connects the, something inside of you below propositions there's no propositions in music to something outside of you that's not bound to your beliefs and you feel the connectedness that music and that's why you love music and etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i look we 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 we've got some i don't know if it's convincing but it's pretty good evidence that even primates experience moments of awe They'll, they'll, they'll walk to the edge of a precipice and just watch a sunrise wrapped in it. Why are they doing that? It's not helping them get food. It's not helping them have sex. They're just doing it because there's a part of our cognition that is evolved to get connected to what's most real beyond us. Yeah, I, I guess I wasn't trying to say that relig without religion, we can't have it. I was just pointing out that as people walk away from religion they're they're not compelled to do those practices that we're doing more than they give credit for i guess i don't know um, right. and i would i would argue you can be stuck or have that same kind uh, of stuck within a religion as well as you and if you're really not believing it you're staying because you choose to stay like you're just oh. You're just yeah. like, I'm going to force this and I'm just going to stay. And you can actually be like very, very stuck. That's how I, that's how I, I it went out for me is I was very stuck as I was trying to force I totally it. Agree. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that religions bear, the existing religions bear tremendous responsibility for exploiting people, traumatizing them, getting them stuck, not actually helping them cultivate. I, I am not here to apologize mm -hmm. for religion. I'm trying to no, say... No, I didn't, I didn't feel you were. I was just... Right. Yeah. I, but I do want to address the question you asked, right? When people are in a religion and they leave religion, they, they'll often find themselves, without realizing it, drifting into cultivating somewhat unconsciously different sets of sacred oh. things, different yes. rituals, different practices. Um, and what I'm, what I'm suggesting to people is, right, participate in that, but participate that in that with more scientific understanding and more philosophical reflection yeah instead of like and that's that's something um i just did a presentation for like a little book club and it was just my ideas i and i gave a huge disclaimer at the beginning and it was like this isn't work for you please don't this is my experience and it's been i've really had an endeavor to try to um have relationships across difference divides I don't know. I just, that feels really important to me. And I have, I, I don't want to be in echo chambers. I have some good reasons I feel like. And then there's another reason that's just, I can't describe what it is. It just, I feel like I should do that. Yeah. Um, and so I gave a presentation and um, I was using a book that David Burns wrote called Feeling Good Together. 
And a lot of it is you're not trying to change the other person. You are trying to do what you can to change your end of the relationship because ultimately you can't change That's them. Right. And That's so, right. um, so I had one of the slides that I presented was, am I growing or am I just flip-flopping? And there's some common phrases that I remember believing and saying as a believer that are very dismissive of those that either leave or are not religious in the traditional sense of the word. Obviously, sure. we're all religious, but you know, yes. when people say they're not religious, what they're saying is they don't go to, they don't practice an organized religion, right? Like, yes. so, yes. Um, and then I have noticed that as I went through leaving, there were also dismissive things I said about people that believe. And so my proposition was, am I, am I growing or am I just flip-flopping? Am I, ah, am ah. I, am I still practicing the same? Yes. Yes. Just like, inverted. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And so, um, and so I was trying to encourage those. And, and what I've found is that as I have not been dismissive of my believing family and I say, you know what, like, this is what you truly believe you should do. You have some intuition. I trust your intuition. You should stay. And I support you in that. Um, I've almost a hundred percent. It's been reciprocated back. And they're like, you'll find your way. Like um, clearly what you were believing before isn't, isn't good for you. So like, and, and they've given me freedom to have oh. this experience. Like, and so um it's interesting because nobody wants to be dismissed when they say they believe something or they say, this is the reason why I believe what I believe. You, you, if when they're dismissed, it all defenses go up really fast yes. and that yes. affects relationships. Yes. So yes. if I say, well, you're, you don't really believe that you were just brainwashed and indoctrinated to believe that that's a dismissive yeah. comment, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. and when, on the member side, it's usually, oh, you're being deceived by Satan. That's also dismissive. It's like, no, I feel like this is the right thing to do. Yes. Um, so, so anyway, it was just, as you were talking about um, these religio things, we're yeah. still practicing in them. That made me think of that slide a little yes. bit. Just, I wonder if, <laughs> yeah, I wonder if we're not growing, we're just still have the black and white thinking. It's just... Now we're on the other side of whatever we were thinking before. And that's, that can be very much the case. Uh, I think people often just invert. Uh, I remember doing that myself. I think I see that in elements of even famous people like Mike Lynch. I think I, I just see him inverting Christianity. And instead of the God man of Christianity, there's the Ubermensch, the man God that he's proposing. And like there's ways in which... Um, of course, because if, if we were, if, if Nietzsche himself said, you can't jump over your shadow. If we would expect somebody to completely extricate themselves uh, from that, uh, that would be truly miraculous. Yeah. Um, so I think being, I, I admire you uh, for being reflectively aware of that and that realizing that a dialogical relationship with another person is more important being in dialogical right relationship with another person is more important than having an agreed upon set of propositions. Um, so yeah, um, that, that, that very much converges with what I was saying earlier about, I really love and seek out good faith dialogos with people who may not share all of my beliefs, but do share a commitment to dialogos, a, a, a commitment to prioritizing right relationship over being right about some particular proposition. Yeah. And, and to think that you, you can't, you don't have something to learn from your loved ones that maybe are still within that religious framework and you've wrote, you've rose above everything they could possibly know. And you're not having that relationship where you can learn from them that, it's damaging when it's like your whole social network. So not that, not that making new friends is bad. Like I, I, I love some of the new friends that I've made that have also gone through this experience and, and, and the further we, we get away from it, the more we would rather not talk about that and just develop our friendship later. Right. Like, so it's, um, it's hard. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's, 
It's like when you've left a long-standing romantic relationship that's come to an end. You don't just you don't immediately leap into another relationship because you'll just project onto that person or you'll just do I'll do the exact opposite of what I did with them and then you just end up realizing you're just doing the same mistake just inverted. You have to go through this process. Um, another way of thinking about the meaning crisis is, you know, Nietzsche, for example, may have said to us that God is dead, but he did not teach us how to grieve the death of God. That's a different process. In fact, when somebody's going through grief, the most useless things you can do is to state propositions to them. You have to drop below the propositional level when you're trying to help somebody in grief. Like you have to be with them. You have to be present. You have to bind yourself to them, right? Let them, right, indwell you and you indwell them. You have to know how to interact, right, appropriately. Saying, like, the, the, like you know, right, saying something to somebody who's in grief, like, well, there's, there's other fish in the ocean or you'll get over them. That's, the, that's really cruel. And, 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 you know, and especially when it's, not, when it's not the grief of the loss of a relationship, but the grief of death. Like, that's just, right? And so, well, and that's what I don't want to do as I talk about, okay, well, don't just flip flop. And I'm telling someone, don't just flip flop. I, I really don't want to tell them that. I want them to discover that. And I've been there and I don't want to have any judgment on that. And I, I, it's just, these are ideas that have aha moments, if you will, as I've been yeah. moving through this. And, yes. um, so I'm sharing if I gave my huge disclaimer, if anybody cares, <laughs> And wants yeah. to know how to have a good relationship with people that seems to be working for me so maybe you can try it or no like if you're not ready for that don't like maybe you need to that's set right. some boundaries right now that's fine too like you know you best <laughs> so um but uh, there was another thought i had um I don't know go ahead if you have a thought and maybe i'll remember well i was just going to say that uh, i mean Learning how to properly relate to people is not something you can just do without entering into a dialogical relationship with them, right? Look at what we were just talking about. Like the way you're going to interact with somebody is, are they still within a, a traditional? Are they considering leaving? Are they, have they left, but they're in deep grief? Right? You don't like, here, try this religion now. Right? You don't do stuff. Like, like you really have to know. And uh, so you, you have to know, you have to get something beyond just a set of beliefs about the person. You have to, well, you know, we, we have all these metaphors for perspectival and participatory knowing. You have to step into their shoes and walk around and know what it's like to be them for a while. And we use all this language, but what we're trying to do is say, you really have to, again, established all these non-propositional forms of connectedness to them in order to get a very fine sense, like finesse, of how to commune with them. And then you will know better how to communicate with them. That takes, that takes a concern for wisdom, connection, right relationship, and also a deep realization and commitment to how we all fall prey to self-deception egocentrism, how we project onto other people what we don't want to see or what we want to see in ourselves. Like that takes a lot. This is again, this is well, everything. May I'm I add is, like maybe practicing too. Like you actually well, have to course, practice and fail having these communi try to yeah, the dialogue yeah. and it might fail and you might end up leaving and being like, ah, I hated that. But yeah. You know this even at the level of, of a skill. <laughs> Knowing yeah. that, you know, don't, well, you know, you're, you're doing a martial art. I know, don't, don't punch that way. And then you do it again and you, you try and change it and you try and you have to practice and practice and practice. Same thing with uh, taking perspectives other than your own. We used to have people engaged in a lot of perspective taking other than our own. That's what literature does. Literature is practice with that, but we've reduced literature to entertainment and even worse, We've made it very much now on social media. So it's bound to echo chamber. So the last thing it does is actually make you consider other perspectives in a profound way. So we murble a lot. We talk a lot of propositions about other diversity and other people, but that's not the same thing as investing hours of deep time and careful reflection 
to pursue a work of literature that actually has you train the ability to take perspectives other than your own in a profound and telling manner. That's great. I don't know if you have like two more minutes. I do. Okay. I, do. Um, the, I remember the thought that I had is it's easy to sense your own grief when you're going through this the collapse of belief. And I think um, we don't, we don't realize, especially for parents, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are uh, with the theology within Mormonism, but it's very like families can be together forever is like central. And so wow. Wow. I think when you have um, somebody leave that they're leaving the eternal family. And so that can cause grief on their end as well. And so I think you have both sides that are damaged. And so it's really hard for anybody to rise above and to expect anybody to oh. rise above it. And so it can really damage relationships bad because people say terrible things on both sides and it's just i can imagine it's um time helps i think because you kind of get used to like people being where they're at but then I sometimes think people are they hear, hurt each other so much they're not even willing to um yes. go down that path but anyways no that was that was um, a cool conversation i think we mostly covered a lot of the stuff that we missed so i'm pleased <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. It was a pleasure. Um, I, I, I admire your honesty and I, I admire the way that you're making yourself vulnerable and available to other people. I think that's very, uh, I think that's very noble. And um, I, I think that we often learn, this is Socrates again, we often learn the best when we're trying to teach and help others. Uh, we learn the best for ourselves. And simultaneously we often teach best when, while we're in the midst of learning for ourselves mm -hmm. so it's that loop and it sounds to me like you found that loop and it's opening it's doing what i call reciprocal opening rather than reciprocal narrowing and so i just want to encourage you to keep going um it sounds like you're making a difference to other people's lives in a way that um well that makes their lives more meaningful yeah i hope so and I, and I've learned stuff too. And I did my presentation. There was a gentleman and he, you know, he left the church, came out as gay and left the church a long, long time ago. And he shared a quote and I thought he could share it better than I could. And it just talked about creating your logical family when you don't have a biological family that accepts uh, you. And, yeah, yeah. and it was, and I was like, you know what, like maybe building relationships maybe that's not going to be every individual's journey and they're going to have to figure that out on their own but i think there's um i think there's more people willing to have a relationship than um than we give credit for i guess if we're I if agree. we if we're willing to take on that burden of being the one to put out the olive branch i guess so yeah yeah i think if you come in good faith with as much virtue as you can with the intent of being in right relationship rather than consuming somebody into your belief system then that opens a great many doors we might believe are closed i've yeah. i've experienced that in my life as well yeah well awesome thank you um appreciate thank it you.